I'm Hemant Mehta, and you're listening to the podcast for FriendlyAtheist.com. You can now listen to all of our episodes and see show notes at FriendlyAtheistPodcast.com. I'm here with Jerry DeWitt. Jerry is a former pastor who has since become an atheist, and his story is just incredible. So I'm not going to get into all the biographical information right now. I'll let him tell that part of the story. But Jerry, thanks for being with me. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So explain to the people who may not have heard of you, uh, because I've read a little bit about your story and everything. I've heard it. But uh, what, five years ago, you were still yeah. preaching Very, like in the South. That's right. Actually, um, I preached my last Christian message. have to clarify now because things have gotten complicated. <laughs> you preach a very different message now. Yeah, that's right. So my last Christian message was actually in um, April of 2011. So I joined the clergy, clergy project in May of 2011 and then attended my first free thought convention in Houston, Texas in October 2011, (laughs) and then was outed at the end of October (laughs) and was fired from my very secular job December December the 1st, 2011, and spoke at my first (laughs) presentation to the secular movement like December the 7th, 2011, and we haven't stopped since. So it was like the best of times and worst of times in 2011. It it was. So back back up for a second. You were... You were preaching the gospel. Yes. And at what point do you say, I don't know if I believe in this stuff anymore? Oh, my gosh. You know, the best way that I can describe it, it's almost like um, if you have a pot of boiling water sitting on the stove, right? And all the way back in uh, 1986, 87, I got saved at Jimmy Swaggart's church, right? (laughs) I was 17, late 16, early 17 years of age. And had been raised in a Pentecostal environment in the Deep South, very, you know, fundamental. And so at age 17, my religious pot of boiling water was overflowing. All right. You had a lot of it. Had a lot of it, and it was very, very hot. Very (laughs) fervent. Lots of boiling, lots of bubbles, bubbles, (laughs) bubbles, bubbles everywhere, to the point that it spilled out, and that's what produces a ministry, is that you now (laughs) have to go tell other people about it, you know. And so, um, unbeknownst to me, though, as I begin to study theology, as I begin to, you know, get older and look at life and look at the hard questions of life and then take responsibility for the people that were under my care in the ministry, I begin to ask questions. And so That's a problem. That's a problem. That's a serious, serious problem. And so almost immediately what I what I was doing, but I was unaware of, was every time I would ask a question that the answer took me a little bit away from the theology and the tradition of my family, I was bumping the dial down on the stovetop. So, for example, uh, what's a question yeah. that like took yeah. you a little away from that hardcore fundamentalism? Well, I didn't know that I had bumped it so yeah. hard, but the first question was the biggest right off the bat was, is there really a hell? Is hell a reality? And who goes there? And why is that God's best plan? You know, to torture someone from all of e- for right. all of eternity. I I was such a humanist. I didn't know it then. Yeah, you know, didn't know the terminologies, but I was such a humanist that I would even ask, okay, so God's got this rebellion going on in heaven of these uh, of these angelic beings who are already immortal. You know, they can't be destroyed. They can't cease to exist. Why would you even create hell for the fallen angels? Why would you even create hell for for the demons or for the devil himself? Couldn't you think of a better plan other than having them roll around in a house fire for billions and billions of years? Yeah, I don't even. Know, yeah, even if you wanted to punish them, yeah. like at some point, it's like yeah. I, I think they've paid their penance. Like, what what do you get out of still right. torturing? Freeze them, them you know. Yeah. Freeze them. Put them in the freezer and just freeze them for forever. Right. You know why? Why do they have to be an agonizing pain? Right. And so, of course, modern Christians will say, "Well, you know, uh, hell is a metaphor, and it's not really flames. It's really the 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 searing pain that comes from." eternal separation from God and all those things. But that wasn't who we were. We definitely believed, you believed in, a, in a fiery hell. That's right. Yeah. And so at age 17, I began to question a fiery hell, and that immediately began to turn the dial down. I didn't know it. Yeah. I didn't know it was turned the dial down. Actually, I thought it was just the opposite. I thought every time that I discovered something new, 
obviously it was new to me. It wasn't new to the world. You know, these doctrines, different forms of doctrines have existed for hundreds, if not thousands of years. I actually thought it was bringing me closer to God, that yeah. it was actually bringing me closer to the truth and to a, a truer, clearer, pure, more loving representation. You understand God. Christianity even better even now. Even better. I was yeah. a better Christian. I was, I, was, I was what Jesus actually meant for us to be. I remember listening to This American Life and the story of Carlton Pearson, I believe was oh, his yeah, name. Oh, yeah, And he, he shared something similar, that it was right. hell that pushed him away from that more fundamentalist faith. That's right. And thanks to the power of the internet and, and of networking, yeah. um, I came across Carlton Pearson and made connections with yeah. him, and he actually became a mentor of yeah. mine, uh, had lots and lots of conversations with him. He During this time when you oh, were yeah, a pastor? Oh, yeah, during this time. Yeah, but I couldn't tell anybody. Uh -huh. you know, I couldn't tell anybody for two reasons. One, because he was already an outcast, yeah. you know, and number two, because he was black, Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that was that was a thing for some people in for, my circle. Okay. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, cuz they're like, well, you know, who you, you know, you even gonna... though they believe in the same faith, that yes. didn't that brotherhood didn't bring them together. You, no, for some no, people. No, absolutely not. Not in my little world that yeah. I was in. Matter of fact, we would I And would where see, are you by the way? Yeah, so in Deritter, Louisiana, Southwest Louisiana. Now, this is not in any way to imply that everyone in Derrida, Louisiana, is uh, racist, not by any sure. stretch of the imagination. We're fortunate that we have uh, a very large military base about 20, 20 minutes north. And so, you know, we get a lot of different people from lots of different places across the country, if not across the world. So I'm not making that implication. But in the little church that I was in and the time that I was in that church, I would see African-American families come to visit. You know, they're trying out different churches. They're looking in the phone book and they see Church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they think, well, that sounds, you know, kind of interesting and dedicated to Jesus, which is what they're looking for. And, you know, they would show up and they would be treated very kindly. But before it was over, the pastor would pull them to the side and say, um, you know, we love y'all and it's going to be great being in heaven with you. But between now and then, we just think it'd probably be better for you to be somewhere else. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Damn. Okay. So you get in yeah. touch with Carlton. Yeah. You don't tell anybody oh, really. Oh, no, absolutely not. Yeah. Uh, I would even travel across, to, you know, I would travel over into Texas where he would be... Um, speaking at a convention of these universalist type folks and um and I would sneak over there I'd make excuses to go and and see him and uh, you know and and get to sit with him and get some mentoring from him to this day uh if I had my phone on I could show you he and I we still text back and forth and I still call him papa that's great I love him I love him dearly he's probably one of my favorite people on the whole planet so you start to yeah. question this doctrine of hell. You're talking to yeah. Carlton Pearson yeah. a little bit, and you're still very Bible-believing. You're still Christian yes. at this point? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, even even more so. You know, it's strange how you can morph the Bible in your mind to where it actually becomes like, um, you're not probably old enough to appreciate this, but, um, you know, you used to get in the cereal box a Dick Tracy decoder ring, you know, or like a box of Cracker Jacks or something, you know. Yeah, the special little prizes the special inside. special little prizes, and, and that little prize would be a decoder ring Ring that you could use to decode some secret message, you know. Okay. And so what happens is the Bible, on one hand, is still very literal, but on the other hand, it's also cryptic and it has these hidden messages that if you are sincere enough, if you serve God wholeheartedly enough, um, then he'll give you the clues, you'll turn the dial, and suddenly you'll see something that maybe, who knows, maybe even the Apostle Paul himself didn't see. And that's what I thought I was doing. Okay. So at what point do you do you start questioning even more? What point do you start yeah. saying, what time, when does the water stop boiling a little yeah. more? Yeah. Okay. So the water <laughs> stops boiling more whenever I discover that the King James Version, um, and not that anyone believes this, but we acted as if this is what we believed, yeah. um, when I discovered that that it wasn't written by Jesus' own hand. What? Yeah, exactly. I know it's a, <laughs> it's a shock. Nobody can believe this, but yeah, yeah we, we, we only taught out of the King James Version of the Bible. And so when I stepped back a little bit further, you know, trying to see the forest in spite of all the trees— and I begin to say, well, how, how did the Bible actually come together? Because I'm troubled over this word hell. People like Carlton Pearson and, and just a whole slew of other beautiful, beautiful human beings are now showing me that this word, when it was translated, uh, brought over into the English that maybe it was misrepresented. And here's the reason why it was misrepresented. 
then suddenly the question is, well, is the Bible really the Word of God? Is this really a physical representation of God? And could or, it be inerrant? If could it be? There, I mean, that's right. If it has can some it mistakes, inerrant? what's up with that? That's right. If man can have that kind of influence on it, then what's up with that? So for, for where I came from, once you're questioning um, the nature of the Bible itself— the water is a lot colder than what you think it is. Yeah, your noodles are not going to get done. Not now. Yeah. <laughs> so how old are you when you're ready to take a step really away mm. from from the faith? Well, see, here's the problem is that by the time I got to the Bible is an issue, I was already in the ministry for several years. And um, I had already built up a reputation, an identity. It was a career. It was how we were making a living or at least trying to make a living. And so the investigation into what was true was sporadic. You know, I would hit a new level of understanding. And it's not like when I got to that point, I would then dedicate every single minute of every day <laughs> trying to get to the next level of understanding. Right. It might be months. It might sometimes be a year or more before I would really investigate the next thing. You, you know, know what? And it's true for atheists, too, because, yeah. I mean, I know plenty of atheists now. And it's funny, for all the talk about skepticism right. and questioning your beliefs, right. I mean, I would have to think for a long time before I could tell you the last time my mind was just blown yes. away and I really changed something I truly believed. I'm not going out and looking for it, but maybe right. if it comes across, I'll be like, oh, that's interesting. And maybe it'll seep in eventually. Right. But you're right. I mean, it's hard for us when we've been atheists for a while to to think that, no, it's What's really the next? hard to yeah. change your mind <laughs> on is. something you believe so uh, so fervently. You're right. And it is what I, I can't say that it's, uh, that I'm truly disappointed, but it's one of the things that I miss from that time in my life versus now. Because it was so exciting. It might be sporadic, but but it felt like it was happening far more often than it happens now. <laughs> now you learn you these know. new things learned that just new thing. changed your worldview. And it was incredible. I would, you know, I would envision it like this. You imagine the Bible sitting in front of you with the pages open, and all of a sudden one sentence um, means something to you it never meant before. Yeah. And it's like it's like all of a sudden that <laughs> one line would glow and that line would then streak out across the entire Bible. <laughs> You know, and it's like, oh, wait, and you could flip all the way back to Genesis and say, okay, based on this new thing I just right. figured out, that changes this in Genesis, <laughs> that changes this in Exodus, that changes this in Leviticus. That's what this really means over in Revelations. And so suddenly it's like your whole life goes up to a new level. Yeah. Very, very, very exciting. So I, I kind of miss that. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> I mean, yeah, like you're saying, it's not like a, it's a bad thing that you got away from that. But yeah, you're right. getting this. I, I kind of wish something would yeah. shake me up every once in a while, and it really doesn't uh, anymore. It's, it's going to be when the Vulcans land. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, now that's going to be it. <laughs> so at some point here, you're yeah. thinking, I have a lot of these questions. Yes, I have a lot of these questions. And so so the next big hurdle, and this begins to happen in my late 30s, heading in my early 40s, uh, the next big hurdle is supernaturalism itself. Because the the ministry that I'm engaged in and the people who, who, for lack of better words, follow me are all in the Pentecostal charismatic realm. Right. And so when I start saying, okay, like for instance, I stumble across uh, the Jeffersonian Bible. Yeah, right. the one without all the supernatural The one miracles. without all the supernatural stuff, yeah, <laughs> you know, because now I'm investigating, well, what is the true history? Yeah. You know, this is what I've been taught about American history and about the Founding Fathers, but I was also taught stuff about the Bible that's turned out not to be true, and the characters within the Bible are not necessarily, like, for you instance— You mean they're not 900 years old? Yeah, like, maybe <laughs> maybe they weren't 900, or even, even more troubling for me, because you could play with all that math. Yeah. You could be like, okay, you know, somewhere in translation— they added a zero. You know, I mean, that happens. <laughs> the begats yeah. could make sense on a timeline if you put it all together. That's right. Yeah. If you're, that's right. And and what is a thousand days? You yeah. know, I mean, a, a, or a thousand years. A thousand years is to a day to the Lord, and a day a thousand years. You know, you've got yeah. all these loopholes. But what really the technicalities that really got me when it came to the gospel and what Jesus actually taught was understanding in the New Testament. There's two gospels. And they talk about it very, very clearly. You have the gospel that is taught by Peter and his followers in Jerusalem, and then you have the gospel that is taught by Paul and his followers in the Gentile nations. Mm -hmm. And they declare there are two gospels, and one is called the gospel of the circumcision, the ones for the Jews, okay. and the gospel for the uncircumcision are the ones for the Gentiles. 
And all of a sudden... This is I, news to me, by the way. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's important stuff. And yeah. all of a sudden, I start looking at, and of course, I've gotten older, so I've had more experiences. I've had experiences in the political realm. I've had experiences in, in organizational you know, structures and so forth. And so I know a little bit more about people yeah. than what I did when I was 17 getting saved sure. to Swaggers, right? And so all of a sudden, I can, I can see how this looks, that this is an organization that is fledgling, that is, that is many times in hiding, all right? Which back, organization? Talking about early Christianity, okay. all right, back, you know, uh, in the first century. And, they're and trying to grow. They're trying to grow. They're trying to make their place in lots of ways. They're illegal and they're <laughs> hiding, but they're also fractioned. They they also have factions within their organization, and they're actually preaching. And it talks about it clearly in the New Testament. Two different gospels. So now you're getting into some core issues here. Of yeah. of is there a real bottom line to Christianity? Is there a real Christianity? Because Paul had one Christianity, and Peter had a different Christianity. It's long before all the schisms within oh, the church yeah. and all. Yeah, that. it makes all the you know Baptist versus Methodist look stupid, right? Because they had these problems in the very beginning of right. things. And so I then had to back up and say, um, how many times have I seen a real miracle? Yeah. How many times have I have I seen something that can't now be explained? through the other forms of knowledge that I've taken on. Like, for instance, I went through a very, very dark time with an anxiety attack and a panic attack disorder for, for years. I uh, got to the point that I was agoraphobic. I couldn't hardly leave the house. Uh, for months, I had a little sales job along with my ministry, and I would get up every morning, get dressed, pretend that I was going to drive about 30 miles to work, and instead I would drive about three miles and go down this little this little logging trail road and literally sit in the car and bake all day and then drive home so my wife would think that I'd gone out to do my sale calls and stuff because I was having too many panic attacks. I couldn't get that far from the house. So I started having to study on What's happening? What's happening to me? And all of a sudden, the whole world of psychology and of neurology, all of that opens up to me. And I start finding out that you can think things that aren't necessarily so. <laughs> you know, I, the panic attack would tell me that I was going to die. And my yeah. brain would 100% believe that I was going to die. And I would act as if I was going to die. But that didn't mean I was going to die. So just because I thought it and just because it felt real didn't mean it was real. So I started applying that to my, at that point, then 15 years worth of experience yeah. in ministry. How many things that I saw, how many things that I felt that I had based my faith on that may not have been real. So could you now come up with explanations Absolutely. for things that you once thought were miracles? Sure. 100%. Sure. Now, there's some things that I can't, and the reason I can't is because I can't go back and apply the scientific method to a memory or sure. to an experience that can't be yeah, duplicated. To a feeling you had once. Right, right. exactly. Um, but it's obvious that the visions that I thought I saw and the dreams that I thought were supernatural that I used... As, to justify something. Yeah, and as I used as decision makers, we yeah. moved a thousand miles because I thought I heard a voice. Yeah. And I was like, gee whiz. <laughs> <laughs> and it changes the whole course of your life. It, and to go back and say, absolutely. well, that might have not been right, that's kind of right. devastating that's too, I'm a, sure. That's a very hard thing to do. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we literally sold everything that we had that we could sell. What we couldn't sell, we gave away. And what we absolutely had to have, we fit into a little Ford Aerostar van with our three-year-old son mm -hmm. and drove a thousand miles to live with people we didn't know. And they turned out to be 100% uh, a cult. <laughs> So, yeah. you know, makes for a great book, though. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> well, we'll get to that. So at some point here, you decide uh, you don't think you buy into this anymore. You've taken mm -hmm. enough leaps away. The water is not boiling anymore. Yes. Are you still preaching at this time? Yes. And so so here's where I'm at. Um, when I take my second to last church, uh, Grace of De Quincey, probably my, my favorite, no doubt my favorite yeah. ministry experience, uh, especially for the first two years because I was full-time pastor and uh, I spent my day on the phone with the congregants, you know, all day long. It, it was it was wonderful. It was it was yeah. wonderful. I'm I'm really losing supernaturalism. 
I'm probably heading more towards being a deist because mm-hmm. I don't understand enough about the physics. You know, um, that's a safe way to handle. <laughs> it's a very safe way to handle. It. That's right. So I'm I'm more towards a deist. I'm definitely still very much a fan of Jesus. Yeah. Right. Or at least the Jesus that I had been taught about and the Jesus that I had been promoting. Yeah. The superhero Jesus. Yeah. Right. Uh, the Superman Jesus. The better you Jesus. And so, um, so I was still very comfortable in my conscience. I was still very comfortable with, with, with dealing with those things. And I would pray for people um, in a way that looked exactly like it would have been years ago when I believed in the supernatural, but I would do it for them. Yeah, because I thought that's what they needed, and yeah. it was all that I knew to give. You know, there wasn't. I'm sure a lot of doctors do the same thing with their patients. Like, sure. you need to feel good, you need that's comfort. Right. So I'll, I'll pray with you, even if I don't think it's going to do anything. Absolutely. And so I, I really do feel like it was a humanitarian act. I felt like it was, you know, something that I. It was all I had, so I was using what I had. Yeah. Um, but I was comfortable with the idea of building community. I was comfortable with bringing comfort. We were very much in the mode of wanting to figure out how we could fight the drug problem that was in the community. How we could fight uh, the poverty that was in the Some community. Some very practical things. Very practical yeah. things. Um, we were a small little church, so we struggled to be effective with it, but we were trying to do those things. But what, over time, when I got further and further away from supernaturalism, what I began to figure out was, was that regardless of what I said on Wednesdays and regardless of what I said on Sundays, these very devout, loving people were filling their time with listening to other voices during the week. They were watching Christian television. They were watching Pat Robertson. They were going to somebody else's church on Thursday and Friday nights. They were traveling really? across the... Oh, absolutely. Sure. How yeah, much? very devout. That's yeah. So yeah, how much do you need? No, even yeah. if you're very devout, yeah. I'm like, yeah. really, twice a week maybe isn't oh, enough yet? Oh, my gosh. The church, <laughs> the cult church I mentioned in yeah. Des Moines, we had Wednesday night. It started at 7.30. It went for three hours on a Jesus. Wednesday night. Then we had it Friday night. Then we had it Saturday night, then Sunday morning and Sunday night. Are you pa- are you doing different sermons for all these? Oh, I was an I was a student minister at that church. Was yeah. someone doing? Oh all yeah. The- oh, oh my that's god. That's right. Yeah. Absolutely. As a teacher trying to come up with lesson plans, that sounds disastrous. <laughs> well, you know, the great thing about it is, is you can just get up and ad lib, you know, and, and you know, it's, add it's the enough. bravado and stuff. That's right. And you're good to go. That's exactly. And, and hope the music does its thing. And, you know, right. you hope people get into it. You know, one but of your for favorite. three hours. For three hours. It's ridiculous. And I mean, and that would be, and when I say three hours, I mean, that's two and a half hours of somebody yeah. speaking. Yeah. And only about a half hour of music. Right. You know, so, so, um. As I moved further and further away from supernaturalism, I began to realize that that the voices they were listening to when they were not at church was really not only having a greater effect on them than what I was saying, because I was pretty much in a mode of, um, I no longer, I had not preached hell for years and years and years, but because I didn't say there was no hell. Yeah. And this leads to the second problem. People assumed I believed sure. it. Sure. Because you're not getting up saying you don't believe it. They right. just assume it. And so the two things begin to happen. One was people's lives were still being affected by other voices. And so even though I'd get up and preach, love your neighbors yourself, and that's really all there is to this whole thing, they would still come back thinking it was other things to it. And then uh, the second and the hardest part for me was regardless of what I did or did not say, people assumed that I just they they thought I agreed with Pat Robertson. That's sure, the bottom and line. you weren't giving them easy, any reason. And not I wasn't giving to them any that. real reason other than preaching really, really, really strong and clear messages <laughs> um, about. Um, you know, I just wouldn't use the terminologies was what sure. it was. But if they were listening closely, they were going to hear that I believed everyone went to heaven and that I believed that um, that everyone was loved by God and everyone was equal. You know, like one of my big messages was I would say I want all of our children to grow up at the Lord's table. I want them to all grow up feeling as if they're already a part because they are already a part. Well, people took that superficially as going, oh, that's sweet. That's nice. You're like a giant horoscope here. Yeah. I'll just take from you whatever I want. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Right, right, right. That's exactly right. That's exactly what was happening. And so what they weren't seeing was that I was removing all the initiation rights, you know, of people having to get baptized, of people having to speak in other tongues, of people having to come down and accept Christ. I was I was doing away with yeah, all of that. But they think you believe all that. But they still think that you believe all of that. Yeah. And so... Eventually, I came to the conclusion that that church, that church in particular, did not belong to me. Sure. It belonged to them. 
All right. They had already been in existence seven years before I started pastoring full time. Um, it was their money, their time, their energy. I didn't feel like I had the right to get up one Sunday morning and say, look, I don't believe in a hell. Matter of fact, I'm not even sure if there's a God. If there is a God, then, you know, it's the God of Thomas Paine, you know. Sure. Um, I just didn't feel like I had the right to do that. So I lied and said, with this job that I've gotten out at City Hall, which they all pressured me to get, mm-hmm. so with this job now— Like just a regular secular job? I had the mayor's chief of staff. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah but a regular secular yeah. job. But they brought me in because I was going to be the preacher in City mm-hmm. Hall. They wanted that persona. And the church people, they supported me doing it because now it was going to be a good, strong, right-wing Christian right. in the local government right. helping shape policy. Uh, little did they know. Yeah. And so um, so I just lied and said, look, my wife, you know, she's got illnesses. I can't be here like I should be, like I want to be. I don't live in the town. And so, you know, there's a little distance and that causes a problem. And I've got this job thing. And so I'm just going to bail out. But at around the same time, this other little church opened up four minutes from my house. And this is how still messed up I was, okay? <laughs> I drove to check out that church and it was four minutes from my driveway, my the driveway at my home, to the parking spot that I would park in at this little church. And it was also four minutes from my driveway to my parking spot at City Hall. Yeah. And I was like, that's God, man. Yeah. That's God. <laughs> That's course. God. That's a message. That's, that's a sign, right? Yeah. And so I left that charismatic church, went to this, what I thought was going to be a very liberal and very um, open church because they were ex-Presbyterians. And um, I was I was in for a rude awakening. They were they were just as just as conservative and just as literal as the people I'd left. They just didn't speak in tongues. Gotcha. <laughs> so how did you find out about the clergy project then? Yeah. So um, I have I have this big huge moment of crisis in May of 2011, and out of desperation, I just um, I, I literally I'm, I'm I'm in the bathroom on the phone when I have this moment, and so I hang up the phone and I go and I get my laptop and I bring it back down to the guest bathroom because I'm not wanting to wake the family yeah. up. And uh, and I just Google preachers who don't believe. Yeah. And the first name that comes up that I recognize and remember is Dan Barker. Sure. Who's and, written about losing faith and faith was his book at the time. Exactly. And I remembered that book from yeah. back in the 90s. I didn't read it, but I knew it existed. You and know? just if you're unfamiliar, I mean, he was the same position. Exactly he was a, right. I think, Pentecostal. Maybe. He was. Yeah. He was. Preacher. Right. He worked with a traveling ministry That's right. and he lost his faith and he wrote about and it. And he wrote about it and then, you know, met Annie Laurie Gaylor on the Oprah Winfrey show. Right. And, and you they know, started the Freedom. Oh, well, the, Freedom yeah, from Religion Foundation in, had started, but right. he, he came on board with that group. That's right. And then later married her and yeah. you know, lived heavily after her. Right. Yeah. So you find you So I Google find and Dan I find Barker. Him. Right. I find Dan Barker. And so um What'd you find? His book? Did you find yeah, uh, some so, article about him? Yeah. First I found uh, I found his book. The first yeah. thing that came up was the book. And so then I start Googling a little bit and reading a little bit about him, you know, and go to the wiki page and yeah. those kind of things. And um and so then I in there find, you know, freedom from religion foundation and a phone number. And so yeah. the next day I call and I leave a message. And by then, now I've, I've gone several hours of searching. So now I realize he's a rock star. Right, you know? right. And so I People don't expect, in the atheist world know this guy. Yeah, exactly. And so, and I didn't even know there was an atheist right. world. See, that's the deal. Right. I, I really had paid no attention to American atheists. I didn't know that they were a thing. Uh, I didn't know any of this was a thing. Yeah. But I've looked in now and I've watched enough YouTube videos, you know, by the, by that, by making the call that I'm like, I'm just going to throw this out, but chances yeah. are nothing's going to happen. Right. But he calls me back and I'm, I'm floored, you know, because now... I had added, I, I do have to back up and say, I had added to my understanding by then a little bit about Dawkins and yeah. Hitchens. Dawkins and Hitchens had already kind of came Their books on were the already radar. out. Yeah, their books were already out. And, um, and looking for, as I'm moving away from supernaturalism, still very much in the ministry, looking now for scientific answers... I stumble across TED Talks. Mm -hmm. TED Talks takes me to Daniel Dennett. Okay. All right, because he does the TED Talk that refutes uh, Rick Warren. Right. And that leads me to Richard Dawkins, which leads me to Christopher Hitchens. And so I am doing some YouTubing. (laughs) So you you kind of get on board. You read all these new atheists. You hear about the new atheists, uh, rock stars. Right. But I don't, oddly enough, I'm able to see Dawkins, Dennett, Hitchens, um, and then much later on, uh, Barker, 
I don't realize they're connected to a community. Right. Somehow they're just the one off people doing just their own these thing. One off people doing TED Talks, right. doing things, debating people, you yeah. know, lots of debates. And I don't realize behind them is this big, huge, huge community. So when I make that step intellectually and emotionally that I am what I am and I acknowledge to myself that I'm an atheist, I saw nothing but this big void. I'm thinking I'm about to step off into nothing. Right. You know, and so there's no safety net. For there's you. no, there's nothing. There's no family. There's no ministry. There's no nothing. And so when Dan Barker calls me back and tells me, about the clergy project, yeah. that was the beginning of a new life because I'm like, okay, there's other people there. And the clergy project is kind of like this underground online forum for anonymous That's right. pastors That's to exactly. talk about their doubts. That's exactly what it was. And it was very much underground. It was not public in any way yet. There right. was no public website. Um, no one had written about it. Was it a mailing and list at this time? Or was it, was, it an online it was, forum you, you had went to on know to? Dan Barker. Yeah, it was, it, was, <laughs> right. it, was, it was really, you just about had to know Dan Barker yeah. or Linda Lascola. You know, there was a couple of people right. that, um, that had to bring you in, yeah. you know, and say, okay, I'm going to talk to the webmaster person and <laughs> they're going to give me a link. And and they you vet in. you, I believe, to oh, get yeah, on that absolutely. forum because they don't want anyone getting in and finding That's this right. information out because it's damning information. And at that time, the vetting was, was uh, I guess it's still kind of family-like now, but it was very much family-like then because it was so small and, and it was really Dan Barker or Linda Scholar or somebody like that vetting you. And of course, now it's very, very regimented and right as know, it needs to yeah. be. As it needs to be, yeah. right? And the more it grows, the more complicated. So, in the it span be. of a couple months, you go from like, "Well, I'm yes. going to contact Dan Barker," to "Wow, there's a whole bunch of other people Boom. who are coming exactly where I'm coming from." That's exactly right, and 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 felt energized by it. Um, was a little afraid, yeah. you know, a little afraid of it. What are you finding out in these discussions in the forums? In the forums, what so, are you talking about? Yeah. So the first thing is. Um, I know this is going to sound crazy to your listeners, but a fear that a minister can have is that this whole thing is nothing but Mm self-sabotage, that there's just something wrong with you. You know, because you, so many of your peers seem to be handling the same problems you're having without any problem. They have doubts, but they get over it. They have doubts, but they get over it, or they just deal with it, or they, you know, look at it from a different perspective, you know, or whatever. And and when you, when your conscience will not allow you to do that, you can really wonder, is it just me? You know, because here I was, I, I was pastoring a nice little church running about 100 folks. Um, I was the chief of staff at City Hall. Um, That's a good life. Yes, yeah, second person, you know, in command of our yeah. little town that I'd grown up in. You yeah. know, there was a, there was a lot of significance to that. Driving, you know, driving a city vehicle, a nice new blue Durango with mm-hmm. a big office across from the mayor, and everybody knows me. And so, so things are. We bought our first home, you know, and things so are things good. things are good. Things are good. Yeah, why mess you know? that up? Why mess that up? And it's like. <laughs> Is there something wrong with me? I mean, yeah. and so when you get in there, what it reminded me of was when I was having all the anxiety issues, I got this program called Attacking Anxiety. Okay. You know, I was up like two o'clock one morning and uh, Lucinda Bassett had the Attacking Anxiety program. And it was like 18 cassette tapes to try to help you deal <laughs> with your anxiety. And the very first cassette tape is nothing but people sitting around talking about their anxiety issues. Sure. And I remember the relief I felt. I was like, okay, I'm not insane. Right. It's not some horrible neurosis. It's not a brain tumor. You know, this is normal. I had that exact same experience when I got in the clergy project. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm not insane. It's not a ro- neurosis. I'm, you know, uh, it's not a brain tumor. I'm not devil possessed. <laughs> you know, there's other people that have these same so problems. Then this is the amazing part to me because I can totally understand at this point people going into the clergy project. What amazes yeah. me is that you and a handful of other people decided, okay, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna go public with this. Yeah. I'm gonna actually tell people I think this way. Right. right. At what point do you think, all right, you know what? It's yeah. not enough to stay anonymous behind this forum. I'm going to tell, tell people. So I have to give, I have to give a certain amount of the credit. Um, you know, I will take some credit and I'll definitely take some, I'll allow my son to take some credit for, for what we eventually did. Um, because my son had been expressing his individuality about two years before I did. Mm-hmm. He wasn't saying the A word, probably didn't even know he was an atheist, but he was definitely Definitely wasn't going for all the, you know, hoopy juke that his dad was, you know, right. selling. Um, 
But what happened was, was I was flying under the radar, and I thought I was getting away with it. And I go to the Free Thought Convention in 2011, uh, 2011, because Dawkins is going to be there, and Dawkins is going to give the Free Thought Dawkins Award to Hitchens. Right. And Hitchens is there because he's getting treated for his cancer. Right. In this Houston. is one of his last public I think uh, it's his very last yeah. public appearance. And so um, so I can't resist that. You know, right. so, I, so I have to go. And I make a lot of great friends, yeah. you know, really now figuring out there's this big community, all this awesome stuff's going on. I start immediately getting advice, you know, lose the preacher hair, <laughs> lose the preacher voice, lose the preacher jacket, you know, yeah. preachers aren't real popular around here, you know, and all that. <laughs> and um, and so when I come back home, um, I make a couple of small changes on my Facebook page, but I've only got like 200 friends, yeah. you know, I mean, I don't even Changes really being what? Like, like, for instance, I had never chose a religion yeah. on Facebook. And so I came back and put secular humor. Humanist. Really? Yeah. I just That's a big change. But I didn't think anybody would notice, to right. be honest with you. I mean, I wasn't making a statement. Yeah, I who just, goes looking for someone else's religious That's right. Uh, label. And the main thing was was that I'd made these new secular friends, and when they did look me up like they said they would, I didn't want them to think, something wrong with this guy? What's his, what's his deal? <laughs> He's you infiltrating know? us. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I made that little change. The other thing I did that probably seems naive on my part now was thanks to being in the clergy project, my son and I got to spend some quality time with Dawkins at that event. Yeah. And so um, we took a picture with him. Yeah. So when I came back, I posted that picture. <laughs> uh huh. And um, and at the time, I didn't even tag anybody with it. You know, right. it was just a picture I put up on Facebook. Yeah. And I remember some of my old church folks because I had stopped pastoring by then. Yeah. Some of my old church folks, you know, liked the picture. You know, <laughs> and me and my son would kind of giggle about it. You know. Yeah. Not in a not in a cruel did they, way. Did they have just, any idea who he was? They didn't have any idea. Yeah, they okay. just thought it was a great picture. Oh, of me it's and my him son, and another and this, old guy. Yeah. That's this sweet. This gray headed <laughs> professor looking guy. You know. Right. And um, and so. So over time, though, as I was as I was making more secular friends, just over a course of a couple of days, uh, I had my aunt Grace, which was actually my grandmother's first cousin. Okay, but we always called her Aunt Grace. She's eighty. Yeah, I'm Indian. Everyone I know is an aunt. Is aunt, aunt right? Yeah. Right. And so uh, she was eighty four years old and was big on Facebook, and I was friends <laughs> with her. And she started figuring stuff out. Yeah. And so she started asking me questions and challenging me mm-hmm. on Facebook. And so, you know, then there was nothing left to do. She, you know, she quickly began to tell everybody in my family mm-hmm. and, you know, and post all these threatening remarks, you know, on Facebook about, you know, how dangerous it is to fall in the hands of an angry <laughs> God and all these kind of things. And so it, it quickly began to be an issue. And so we, we just decided we would get out in front of it. So yeah. I sent out a letter to, there was only eight people out of the 200 people that I had on Facebook, there was only eight people that I felt like that I wanted to tell them before somebody else told them. Wow. And uh, before very long, it just... It and then you came about. out at an atheist oh, conference yeah. then not too long after yeah, that well, too, so right? then Yeah, so then what began to happen was um, I began to get, you know, opportunities to go and speak and, and do little things. Um, but it was it was actually Teresa, you know, that Teresa came out McBain. at the American Atheist yeah. Convention right after the Reason Rally. Right. So this yeah. is in 2012. That was 2012, March of 2012. she comes out at their convention. She's kind of in the same boat as you. Yeah, she's very much in the same boat. She comes, um, if it was a pastor, that's comes right. out as an atheist for the first time. That's right. That's and exactly right. You were where you were not ready to come out. Oh, yet. I was already. You out. were already out. I was already out. Matter of fact, I spoke at that convention. Okay. Yeah, but it wasn't an outing for me because I had already been on the road speaking at other places Got up before then. But yeah. this started a wave of like a few of you guys were just did. coming out, and it That's was right. incredible. That's so right. I remember uh, maybe it was around this time. Uh, I remember reading a New York Times article that right. profiled kind of this journey you had taken. That's right. And uh, I think from that New York Times article, Comes you had a book. chance to write the book. Book, which That's is right. called Hope After Faith. I'll right. leave a link in the show notes and everything. Thank you. So uh, let me ask then. So now it's been a couple of years right. since uh, you made that huge change. The yeah. story's out. Right. Uh, I, no one's surprised anymore. We know this. Yeah, like, right, you know, everyone right, who right. knows you, they probably, you're not outing yourself to That's anybody right. now. Right. So now what has this been like? Uh, are you, your life, I mean, your life turned upside down after that. Was yeah. it a good change to make? Do you kind of wish oh, you were sure. still like the chief of staff, pastor of a small oh, church? Oh, yes. Oh, sure. Of course. I, I always will. There yeah. will always be a part of me that will be um, 
at a minimum nostalgic for that. Yeah. You know, um, I'm only 5'5", five five, and so I'm a very prideful person. You know, I got little man syndrome. <laughs> yeah. I made up with it. So uh, being chief of staff, even though it was for a small town, a big deal. it was a big deal. And I enjoyed being a big deal that way, yeah. you know. Um, yeah, who wouldn't? I, yeah, and I also enjoyed having an effect. You know, yeah. I could I could see things instantly, you yeah. know, and know that we'd made a difference for our community and those things. And so I'll always miss having that type of intimate intimate favor with my hometown. You know, now there's no doubt that that thousands upon thousands more people know me now than knew me then. Right. And I've probably had an even greater effect in people's lives. You right. know, they, they write and say, oh, I love the book and it gave yeah. me the opportunity to do this or that. And so I would never trade one for the other. But it is a um, very different type of love you're different getting. different <laughs> because it's your hometown. Yeah. You know, so, so I always will be nostalgic for that. Yeah. Um, the only regret that I have is... Um, because it all happened so fast, um, I was still very much in, I don't mind being in preacher mode, like even today when I go to speak, I'll probably preach a little yeah, bit. I've People seen think, you talk several yeah. times. You have the preacher's cadence. Yeah. Yeah. You have that voice. Right. Uh, I mean, yeah. if you didn't listen to what you were saying, you would think I would it think was you're absolutely. Yeah. Sure. And and I don't mind doing that. And I think it challenges. Is that an act? Yeah. Is that really you? No, that's me. Yeah. yeah that's, that's just me. how you talk yeah. when you're in front of a crowd. Yeah. Matter of fact, you know, my, my, my wife left not long after all of this broke loose. And because of it breaking loose? Yeah. Because of the effect it had on our lives. Not sure. because of my belief changes, um, but because of the effect it ultimately had on our lives. Yeah. Um, and but but she did come back. That's something a lot of people don't know. Mm-hmm. We've been back together now for several oh, months. Good. And so things are actually better now Congrats. than they were before. Uh, yeah, so it's so it's really cool. But while she was gone, um, and and we were definitely heading towards, you know, a divorce and all those things. She lived a long ways away and all of that. Um, I was riding late one night. Uh, we were at a convention. I think we were in Lakeland, Florida. Yeah. And um, and three two guys and one one young lady all said, We want to go get hamburgers. It's sure. like two o'clock in the morning. You know how it yeah. works at yeah. convention. I was like, that's awesome. Awesome. Let's yeah. go get hamburgers. And so I'm riding in the back seat with this young lady, and the two guys up front, they're just like, oh, man, I've been getting hit on and this and that and flirting and all this is going on and all this action, you know? And I'm sitting yeah. back here kind of sulking because none of it's happening for me, <laughs> you know? And I'm like, what right. is the deal, you know? I mean, I've got a freaking book, you know? I mean, a guy, a guy can't get some loving, you know, and he's got a book, you know? These are the bums. They can't go to Barnes & Noble and see their face on there, you know? But yet, and so, so I'm kind of uh-huh. feeling down about myself, you know? And... Uh, and I'm like, what is the deal? So I just bring it up. Yeah. I never express it. I said, what is the deal? What is wrong with me? You know, yeah. I know I'm a short guy. I know I need to lose 50 pounds. But, <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm the headliner. You know, what's the deal? <laughs> right. And so the lady sitting next to me, and she was a lot younger than me yeah. and had a very, very straightforward personality. But it answers the question that you probably don't even remember <laughs> a, you know, asking now. She immediately turned to me. She says, you never stop being a preacher. <laughs> And I was like, I've never oh. heard of that one on the deal breaker list. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's great. You know, it's that you're always, you're, and, and, and the reason why I'm doing that is because it is me. And I, that is who right. I am. And I'm that way all the time. Right. Yeah. Now, uh, let me ask you. So, uh, one of the things that I love about, uh, well, I mean, I, I've been open as an atheist for a long time. I've been writing the website, doing these other things. I've, I constantly get just positive feedback from people who are just saying, you know, uh, you helped me become an atheist, sure. uh, all that sort of stuff. And the weird thing is I realize I have a platform, all but right. for people who didn't or who think like, well, I'll just come out on Facebook and that'll right. be the end of it. I swear, I, I've never met an atheist who's been out publicly about it who mm. hasn't heard a story like that. Yes. Like everyone who comes out has affected somebody, Absolutely. it seems like. That's I'm right. wondering what sort of... When your book comes out, yeah. it came out when? 2012, 2013? Yeah, um, let's see. Uh, let me think. Uh, June June of what year are we in now? 2015. 15. Yeah, so yeah. 13. So like okay. June of 13. So yeah. by this point, mm-hmm. all these new atheist books are out. The internet, yes. and you can go on Reddit. There's so many resources out there. Right. But I... Without, I don't know the answer to the question, but I'm going to yeah. make a huge assumption. You've yeah. gotten those emails from sure. people. Oh, yeah. Because it doesn't matter. It, right. If you say you're out, if you're making this public statement about, I left, 
if this That's helps right. you along the journey too. What sort of uh, re- yeah. emails did you get? I got all of those kind of emails. I got the, uh, you know, it, it, it blows you away. You get the email of, I, I thought I was the only one. Yeah. I didn't know that even though all these resources are out even there. Even though they're all still out right. there. They're still like, I had no idea. You know, uh, do you know of anybody? Like, I'll, I'll never forget one, one African-American guy contacted me and he says, I just wish that, um, you know, I didn't know that, that this existed. I was Pentecostal as well, you know, stumbled across your book somehow, some way. I uh, didn't know this existed. I wish there was something in my community. And yeah. I, I said, well, where are you at? And yeah. he tells me and I would Google and I'm like, oh man, I've been there. there there's, a, <laughs> there's a group. Right, right there, they meet, you know. And he says, "Oh, really? That's awesome, man. I really wish this was something that you know lived that was lived in the African American community." I'm like, "Dude, the African American community, atheists, that, that, they're they're rock. a tight they're, group. They're yeah, great. It exists." Right. And so finally, we met up. Yeah. And when I'm explaining all this to him in person, just tears are wow. running down his cheeks because he, he no didn't idea. know that it existed. So yeah. that's some of the most exciting. But yeah, kind of makes it worthwhile know. to go through oh, all the shit you had to go through to it, get it to does. that point. It makes it worthwhile. And and going back. Back to what I was about to say, my only regret is I don't mind being the atheist preacher because um, that's who I am, but I wish that I would have known that I was still very much thinking like a preacher as I moved into the movement. And so this is a how piece do you of think advice. Like a, yeah, how yeah. do you do that? Yeah, so so this is advice that I give clergy project members on a regular basis. Matter yeah. of fact, just this week, true ministers— True ministers, I'm not talking about TV charlatans and yeah. televangelists and, or, or even mega church folks because that's not my area of expertise. They're like putting on a show. In a More sense. than could very well be. Yeah. You know, I just don't know because I haven't been there. Right. But that, that guy who pastors 100 folks, maybe even 300 folks, all the way down to 15 folks, yeah. our gal, they, they live a life of self sacrifice. Yeah. And they feel like it's their responsibility to save the world every day. Mm-hmm. And they save the world at the expense of themselves and their families. And that's why there's this huge burnout rate in ministry. Huge, I've heard that, yeah. Yeah, huge, huge burnout rate. Um, and so if a, if a minister is not very careful, when suddenly they wake up to reality and they see what really is important and what really does need to happen for the world to be a better place, they can feel compelled to save it with the same self-sacrificing motives and methods that they had when they were in the ministry. Mm -hmm. And so what I try to say to them now is um, give yourself a moment, give yourself a break, join a group somewhere, just be a member, set and absorb and learn and experience and work with your family and and get things right in your life and then use those skills maybe a year later, maybe six years later, I don't know, maybe six months later. Then use those skills in a balanced way. Don't go from one (laughs) self-sacrificing ministry to another because you can still suffer the same consequences of being burnt out. And, you know, it's being on the road like I've been on the road has just really, really, really hurt my health. Right. And I've done it out of this self-sacrificing mode. And I have to I gotta try to preach pull this, myself back. I got to preach right. this get out of religion thing. That's right. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Yeah, you can take it still. I've cut back a lot on traveling for that reason. Like, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'm a lot more picky, choosy about just, okay, I'll go every now and then, but right. not that much. I don't want to leave home that much. Right, right, you know? right. And there's ways to work around it. Yeah. You know, there's, there's, there's technologies at our disposal. But, but my, my attitude is, is that the minister is always as important, if not more important than the ministry. Yeah. And so you need that person to take care of themselves. You need them to live a balanced life and set a balanced example mm-hmm. for the people that they are going to. They can't help serve. anyone if they're going insane on their own. <laughs> That's right. And, 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 you know, how sad it is because now we know more than we've ever known that this isn't a dress rehearsal. Right. And so how sad it is for that individual who not only will only see the universe once, but as far as we know, the universe will only see them once, right. for them to, yes, great, save the world from supernaturalism, but lose their family, right. lose their life, lose their one time. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, this is kind of tangential to that point, but I've heard people say like, okay, I'm an atheist. I really want to spread that those ideas and stuff. Yeah. Uh, what can I do? I'm going to start talking about atheism, writing about atheists. Yeah. And the thing that is interesting is if you look at, uh, just name a famous atheist, you know, uh, right. Richard Dawkins. He you're, became famous as a scientist. I'm, you're you're, used you're that on it. platform to spread atheism later on. Chris Hitchens right. was a journalist, a writer. That's right. He used that to talk about atheism. I mean, That's Daniel right. Dennett, 
He has a whole research life before him as a professor. That's right. Um, and pretty much a lot of these people, they became experts in some area of life not connected to religion. You as a preacher, really, right. not about atheism. Right. But then you, be, you were good at it. Right. And using that platform, you get to reach a very different audience. So when people are like, what can I do? To uh, I'm a musician or I'm uh, right. whatever. I'm going into research, laboratory work. Good. Go do that. Go yes. be good at business. Go become That's a right. nonprofit leader. Because I promise you, whatever skills you're using, you can use them later. And there will be a way to do it. That's exactly right. I, I being, um, you know, I come across as Mr. Positive and Mr. Loving and Mr. Friendly. And, um, and, and the truth of it is I'm probably the most negative, depressed <laughs> person, you know, in the world. <laughs> And so I came to that conclusion from from the opposite direction. I kept seeing people in the secular movement trying to jockey to be the fourth horseman. Right, right. And everybody's scrambling for that. And somehow, I get, maybe because of previous life experiences or something else, it dawned on me, where I don't think it dawns on everyone quite as quickly, it dawned on me that, that there's no ladder to that fourth position. Yeah. There's no ladder to climb up and, and be that. <laughs> that was a fluke. That was an anomaly right. Right. that happened. But it happened because all those people brought those other lives right. to the table. Yeah, they weren't all coming from the same place. That's right. Uh, and that's, that's right. When you're getting it from all different directions, that's what makes a really that's movement change. That's what makes it really work. And yeah. so they come there with this great level of respect from another field. And now it's and it's the world's greatest esteemed evolutionary biologist. <laughs> right. Who says I'm an atheist? Right. That's different than you know some yeah. normal Again, Joe like me. Bill Maher, comedian, uses exactly. that platform. I mean, that's it, right. it can go on. I can go on for a while. And th- so when I saw your presentation that was telling people that very thing, that's yeah. what tied all the pieces together. And I was like, that's exactly right. That's what people need to go do. Yeah, and, and yeah. you know what? The the amazing thing is, as a former preacher too. Yeah. Uh, you're connecting with a very different crowd, a crowd that may come from that world too. Sure. Uh, people have asked about the Sunday assembly, those atheist churches sure. and whether I like, I love them. And the reason yeah. is, I, you know what? They're really not for me. Right. They're not things I attend. Cause right. I mean, I get enough atheism in my life, Yeah. but for people who left a church, right. but who kind of, who miss the singing, it's who not miss the inspiration, for you, right. It's for other people. Right? It's a great stepping stone to leave right. your church, but not miss out on all the benefits of church. And it's like, why would you be opposed to that? That's a new way of, and by the way, I've been to a couple of those yeah. uh, Sunday Assembly meetings. Yeah. It is a completely different crowd than you would it ever is. see at an atheist conference or a meetup group or, That's or what right. have you. That's so right. good. It, well, so we we're need... bringing a part of the family together yeah. that we normally wouldn't have. That we would not have seen otherwise. That's awesome. So your book is Hope After Faith. Right. And are you doing any other projects right now? Are you working with any organizations right now? I know you're working with Foundation Beyond Belief. Yeah, right. I've been probably <laughs> the most distant board member ever. <laughs> Foundation Beyond Belief. I try to be there with something really important. Right. Happens. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so, of course, I work with Foundation Beyond Belief. Um, you know what? You're, you're going to need to have me back in about a week yeah. because I'll have an announcement to make coming, coming out of North California. Something really, really, really fun. Really fun that's going on. If you want to say stealing. now because this won't go up for a while. It won't go up for a while. <laughs> I won't um, say enough. <laughs> let's see. Let me let me think about how I could work out. No, the, uh, well, I I really would like to come back and bring somebody with me. Sounds because good because we got somebody great working over there. Yeah, she she deserves all the credit. We'll figure that out then afterwards. Yeah. This yeah. That's yeah, great. Fun things. So thank you so much. And uh, yeah, uh, if they want to, if people want to find out more about you, where can they go? Yeah. So what I would appreciate them doing is going to Patreon and looking me up. Patreon slash Jerry Dewitt. Um, I'll I, post a link to that yeah, in the show I, notes as well. I put out videos every Wednesday and every Sunday, um, basically just trying to give people a word of encouragement and talk about the basics of life and how we deal with life emotionally from a secular point of view, from kind of a little bit of a preacher way, not too much. And so that's that's probably the main thing. <laughs> that's awesome. Thank yeah. you, Jerry. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the podcast for FriendlyAtheist.com. If you like what you're hearing, please consider making a contribution at Patreon.com slash Hemant, that's he T. We appreciate your support.